Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shamila Ramjawan coming to you from the Red Corner Chat. And this afternoon, we are going to be speaking to two really inspirational women that are working in the front line. So it's Sidasha Pakri, who's the Acting Assistant Director of Physiotherapy in the Eastern Cape, also the Chairperson for the South African Society of Physiotherapy in the Eastern Cape. Then we have Nirusha Piramal, who's a physiotherapist in a private practice. Hi, ladies. Hi, good Hi. afternoon, Jamila. Good afternoon, Sid. So we're going to get right into it. Um, hey, Manolo. Just going to so mute everyone. Perfect. Okay, um, let's start with Sidasha. Sidasha, do you want to just tell us a bit of your background, where you come from? I know you're from KZN and now in the Eastern Cape. Yes, yes. Uh, so I grew up in a small place called Sea Tides, uh, where I spent 20 years of my life. I went to school there and both my parents are teachers. Um, and then I moved to Queensborough in Malvern. Uh, I went to UKZN, Westall University, where I completed my B physiotherapy degree. Uh, and then I did my community service at Freya Hospital in 2009 in the Eastern Cape, where I ended up staying on, surprisingly. It wasn't part of the plan initially, but I fell in love with the place and the hospital. Uh, it's just a wonderful place to work and I'm still there. Uh, and that's how I ended up where I am. <laughs> yeah, and then I ended up uh, adding a little bit to SASP, uh, which is the South African Society of Physio. Uh, I joined initially as under marketing because I enjoy just promoting the physiotherapy profession. And then this year now uh, took up the position of the chairperson of the Eastern Cape chair, yeah. Congratulations, well done. Nerusha, do you want to tell us about Nerusha? Uh, <clears throat> lots to tell, it depends on what you want to hear. <laughs> the juicy bits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm also from a small town, not too far from where Sid comes, Sudasha, in Tongat. I matriculated in Tongat and then went on to complete my Bachelor of Physiotherapy at the University of uh, KZN. Um, then did a community service in a state hospital for a year, uh, locumed for a few physios um, for a span for about five years. I gained a lot of experience and then in 2013, an opportunity came about and I started practice. Um, I have a postgraduate certificate in orthopedic manipulative therapy and a certificate in cardiorespiratory therapy. So currently now in private practice. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Sidasha, we know everyone's talking about COVID-19 and how it's affecting everyone. Can you just maybe share your experience on COVID-19? I, I think the current death toll in the Eastern Cape is 2,442. Yes, yes. Um, it's been a daunting task. I think initially we were all very scared um, because it's uncharted territory. Um, I think all of us, we didn't know what to prepare for and how to prepare initially. But as the days went by, um, I think we gained confidence uh, after we got into the unit and started treating patients. Um, and it's just exactly what we would do on a normal day. Uh, once yeah. you, I think yeah. the scariest part is once you get into the gear, um, once you just get all that PPE on and then you get into the unit and you actually start doing what you do. I think the first day was just actually scary. And after that, it was, it's the same. It's the same. I think yeah. the biggest yeah. fear is uh, when you go in there and the patients are quite unstable. I think that was initially unsettling, but yeah, we're a few months into it and now it's, it's if I could say, um, we kind of used to it a little bit, uh, yeah, a little bit more used to the experience of going in, getting done, treating patients, um, seeing the instability and knowing what choices to make for those patients at that time. I know Nehru is also seeing quite a lot of COVID patients. She was in the unit today. <laughs> I, I got to see it today, luckily. Yeah. yeah. See. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so you, 
as Sid said initially, it was scary. Um, we don't know. We didn't know what to expect. Um, putting on that uh, PPE, the donning, as we call it, you know, personal protective equipment. So you put on everything to protect yourself, and you uh, kind of like watch. Okay, am I doing the right thing? Am I touching my face? Uh, must I stand next to the patient, behind the patient? And uh, yeah, now it's just like, okay, we're going to COVID. Let's see what we're going to do. Um, yes, the same. So we, uh, the same thing at our hospital. It was, I think, mentally and emotionally draining to see the spike in fatality that, we ha that we're not used to seeing. Um, but... I think we had our storm at the beginning of July in KZN, the hospital where I work, and now it's kind of tapering down. Yeah, that's true. So, um, Nirusha, just tell me a little bit about the role that physiotherapists actually play um, in terms of uh, COVID patients. Okay, so we know from all the research, so COVID's been the mantra for 2020, right? Everybody knows what COVID is about and it affects mainly the respiratory um, system and also now the vascular, the cardiac aspect of it. So physiotherapy plays a vital role in, the, uh, in managing respiratory conditions. So patients present with breathing problems, shortness of breath, tachypneic. Very few will come in with um, uh, mucus retention. So helping to alleviate uh, the work of breathing, uh, physiotherapy plays a vital role in all different aspects from the acute uh, phase when the patient is in ICU to the moderate kind of phase where the patient is in the ward and also uh, mild cases. Um, so physiotherapy plays a vital role in that uh, perspective and all treatment regimens are different from acute to subacute to home. Siddhartha, uh, I elaborate you, a little bit more. Yes, yeah, sorry, you can go on. Siddhartha, um, your point of view in treating uh, patients with COVID-19? Very similar. Um, like Nehru said, there's a role for physio in each stage. And I think a lot of the time when people think COVID, physio is not the first thing that comes to mind. Um, you always think about the nurses and the doctors in the unit. And I mean, um, it's, I think it's a part of physio that's not um, well promoted or that the public is uh, not very well educated about. So when you talk about a physio in ICU, if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me if I was going in to massage a patient, I think I'd be quite rich now. <laughs> so it's just, yeah, you, know, you got to explain to them. We go in to do chest physio and that's our core business, uh, making sure that the patients are able to breathe comfortably. And if they do have a buildup of secretions or phlegm in the lungs, that's where we assist them. Um, to clear the airways for them to breathe better, better, whether they are intubated or on a face mask or even on room air. And then it's simple things like even just exercises. But with COVID, what we were just chatting about myself and Eru was everything is guided by the way the patient presents. It's not what you know. It's not. It's because it's so new. Um, a lot of the patients get very tired very quickly. So you really can't push them. You've got to just uh, play it by ear like as each patient presents. And some of them present so differently from each other, even a mild case. So one mild case can be completely different to another mild case that you've treated. Um, yeah, but like I say, it is, it is definitely a role in each, um, each stage of the disease. We've been trying really hard to make sure that we follow our patients through as far as we can and to equip them with what they need, especially before discharge, so that they can cope at home without us being there and coming in every day to do physio with them. But I think it also helps uh, depending on how long you spend with them in hospital. So a patient that's been there for two weeks uh, feels a lot more empowered because they've had a lot more time with the physio and the physio gives them all that information and education of what they need to do to prep them properly versus a patient that's been in hospital just for two or three days and then needs to go. Um, those patients, we really, I think it's important for them to follow up with us afterwards also. I'm going to come back to that. I just want to ask you a question because I've been, um, I was in hospital in 2012 and I had bronchial pneumonia and I also had physio. Now, a lot of people uh, out there that will be watching this, they obviously don't know what you do uh, whether in ICU or in the room itself. So do you want to maybe take us through that? Maybe you can do one part of it and Nirusha can do the other part. Okay. Um, 
Oh. I'm going to let Nero lead with this question. She's the cardiorespiratory uh, expert with this one. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, she. <laughs> All right, so um, look, we'll, we'll start from your question, okay? So you admitted you were not on oxygen, you had pneumonia, and you had uh, physio done on you. So physiotherapy uses different modalities. We call them airway clearance techniques. Uh, that helps to um, get rid of your phlegm and your mucus that you have, if you do have them. And some of these techniques are called active cycle of breathing, using devices to help mobilize the secretions. <clears throat> and um, other um, um, physical um, modalities, which many people are uh, uh, aware of, is uh, expiratory vibrations and percussions. We also use, in this case, um, in COVID, um, positioning, which is vital, and we, we, it's shown, it's it's you know we're still doing studies on this because this virus is still novel, it's still new. Um, positioning and more especially for these patients, um, proning. Uh, proning is merely just laying on your tummy that helps to improve the oxygenation at the bottom of the lung. That's where most of this virus sits, and if you think about it, it's like um, like a wet sponge that's dense at the bottom. So if you're sitting upright, you're getting air at the top of your lung, but nothing's going to the bottom. And that, that part of the lung at the bottom of, the, of your, the bottom part of your lung is where there's lots of airways and most oxygenation happens at, the, at that point. So if you're lying on your tummy, it helps to improve that oxygenation. Sid, I don't know if you want to continue in the ICU or... Yeah, so like Nero says, a lot of what we do is also um, to do with positioning. And um, it's, it's, in, it's, I think it's incredible to see how patients don't realize how that little bit can uh, change the way they breathe and help them control the way they breathe. They're so much less anxious um, the moment you turn them into a comfortable position. And I think it also helps when you educate them and you explain to them. Like Nero says, you use like a very simple explanation to say why you need them to do what they need to do. And once they comply, they immediately find the benefits of um, that little bit of intervention. So with the patients that are very unstable in the ICU, quite often positioning plays a big role because they're quite unstable. So there's not much intervention that you can do. And that little bit makes quite a big impact. Uh, with the proning, that took us some time at our hospital to get right with the team. I think because it's, um, it's not something that's practiced um, often, even though it should be. So you got a little bit of resistance from some of the team members, but once we started rolling with it and training everybody, we started then seeing, okay, now they're calling us in more frequently to turn these patients. We need six to eight people on the team. It's, uh, it's quite hectic when you watch it. Everybody all done, all six to eight people. And then you have one person that's like coordinating the whole thing, but the benefits are amazing for the patients. Um, I think when you play a role in that and you find how well those patients end up doing, it's really where you, you, you know, you feel that job rewarding feeling where you're like, okay, this is why I did what I did. <laughs> Incredible. I just, I just want to find out, so how important is, is it to do follow-up visits after, to say, post-hospital, you now have recovered in hospital, you heading home, do you still need consultations for physiotherapy? Okay, so um, I, that's a very good question uh, because I remember at the beginning we said at different stages, physiotherapy plays a vital role. Remember, physiotherapy also acts in improving the quality of life in these patients, um, improving their functional ability. Um, after the ICU, the major complication is is weakness, what we call ICU acquired weakness. If you're sitting in a vent on a ventilator, sorry, if you're lying on a ventilator for so many days, your muscles get weak, you're unable, if you've never, I mean, if we had to think about it, if we lay in bed for 24 hours, how would we feel? Quite weak, right? And this goes on for days. And also um, patients are, are put on um, high sedatives to help them to recuperate to their lungs and that. So when they try to wean them off everything, um, I see acquired weakness is a big complication. So we help them from getting their functional ability to improving their respiratory status, improving their hemodynamic status. And then when they move to the ward, then we help more function, even if it's from sit to stand or taking a few steps or just walking to the bathroom, 
helping them out there. Um, and I'm sure um, you, you would know from your chats with the previous doctors that there is a huge complication in the, risk, in, in the lungs post COVID. Patients become, they, their lungs become very fibrotic. You get fibrosis. So follow ups, it's a, it's a process, it's a marathon. It's a marathon, really. So I think the important thing to remember is that you have to reassure the patient. You have to encourage the patient and that follow up treatments are vital. Sometimes the patient will go home and they'll feel less complacent, feel depressed, not being able to do what they usually do. And the important thing here, which I must emphasize, is the approach from a multidisciplinary team, be it from a dietitian to a psychologist, to the pulmonologist, everybody is involved with the care of these patients. On the physiotherapy part, um, getting the patient to their functional, their maximum functional potential is important and improving obviously that quality of life. Okay, so I can understand now with the influx in numbers and a lot of people being admitted in hospitals, what sort of time frame do you look for appointments? Um, so with us, it kind of fluctuates a little bit. Um, we are tertiary hospital, so our outpatient um, is mainly for tertiary type patients, which is difficult. So with COVID patients, because the timeline is important that you cannot give them an appointment in a month's time that we normally do at a, a local clinic and things like that. I mean, I'm talking from the government sector now. Um, so with those patients, we've specifically opened up our outpatients for them squeeze them in on the same days that they come in for their doctor's appointments. It needs to be as convenient as possible. These patients get really tired. And it's quite, I think it's, a, it's really an anxious experience once you go home to leave your home again and come back to the place where you had all that fear and anxiety. So it needs to be a positive experience. So we try to do it quick burst appointments usually. Um, so we've had some patients that were discharged last week. So they come back the following week. Um, when it's convenient. Most of the patients live quite far from us, which is difficult. And we try to get a follow-up for them at their local hospitals, which isn't always um, an option. Like I say, we try to give them the option of coming in on the same day that they have a doctor's appointment to accommodate them and also keep in mind like transport costs and all the rest of it. That's very interesting, Sudarsha. I just also want to find out, in terms of COVID-19 now, and you know, uh, we actually regard every second person out there um, to have the disease, so we can actually you know, uh, practice social distancing. What's being done in the hospitals and private practice? So the hospitals have taken a major approach. Every single patient has to get screened before entry into the hospital. They get asked a multiple, like, multiple questions. They get their temperature taken and then only are they allowed entry into the hospital. Um, they get a little sheet that says they've um, passed the test to come into the hospital and then only, and even then, um, if they come into an, a section where the treating doctor or therapist feels that that test was not done accurately, we then escort the patient back to the screening section to then say, okay, there might have been an error on this. Can we please rectify it? So they've taken um, all the measures that they can. And then over and above that, at every section where the patients enter, they must sanitize, there's social distancing in all the waiting rooms. Um, so every second chair is blocked out, patients are not allowed to sit next to each other. Uh, any patient that comes to the hospital without a mask, um, mostly that doesn't happen now, but it was happening initially before everybody was then, you know, told, okay, you have to wear masks. Then the hospital was issuing masks to patients at the screening section. So yeah, it's, it's a process. <laughs> so coming to hospital isn't as easy as it used to be. And I think it's a little bit frustrating for patients also, because it, it takes more time to go through that proce process, but everybody understands why they're doing it. And Nirusha, in private practice... <laughs> Okay, so in, in private practice, uh, if you're talking about the surgery or the rooms, um, so we follow in our practice, uh, we book our patients every one hour apart. We, from the respiratory side, we tend to keep, if we're doing rehabilitation, we see on that day only respiratory patients. We make sure that there is adequate ventilation in the room, which is very important. Patients that come in for their treatment, um, well, in my practice, I, I don't make a patient sit in the, in the reception. 
the patient sits in the car until we call them and, and we fully uh, clean out the area and disinfect it so that there's no cross-contamination. The important thing to know in any practice in the surgery is ventilation and the distancing. And I think that's important. And I think we've mastered that art of masks now, I hope and the social distancing that everybody cares. And if we can't emphasize it enough, the stuff that really works is social distancing, wearing your masks and washing your hands. And that has proven to be, you know, um, the best treatment so far. Um, from the hospital perspective, uh, in hospital, there's no visitors. So, no patients that, no visitors that are coming into the hospital, but your family can still, you know, um, get you clothes and food and everything. When you have to go to the radiology or go to any other area, they they really max their PPE and the protective mechanism. So it's, it's actually quite safe. In fact, I feel safer in the hospital than going to a shop. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. So I heard the term aerosol generating procedures. Uh, do you want to maybe take me through that? What does it mean? Is it a procedure? What do you do? Sudasha? So, yeah, aerosol generating procedures uh, usually takes place, I'd say, in the ICU or in the casualty section when patients need to be intubated. So when they put in a tube down the throat for breathing or with regards to, so there's other things as well. But specifically for physiotherapy, it would be the simple thing of just even asking a patient to cough. And uh, when it comes to COVID, we are probably the only people that ask patients to cough. Um, and, and the others kind of shy away when you say it. Um, but it's part of the care that the patient requires. Um, but it's because the reason it's called an aerosol generating procedure is exactly that, is because the particles that the patient coughs out, the COVID particles become aerosolized and can spread further than it normally would. Um, initially, they were talking about also nebulization because the droplets can spread further as it flows with the oxygen coughing, and then intubation because the doctors are very much above the patient when they're introducing the tube into the throat. So it puts them at high risk and they came up with ingenious ways of creating a perspex box that goes over the patient's face with holes for the doctors to put their hands in on either side to protect them. The other doctors that are quite at risk are the ENT doctors that do uh, tracheostomies, which is like the operation on the throat where they put in a little tube for breathing. So those, those are the specific procedures that are aerosol generating. But I always say, people laugh when I say, just a cough is enough and it's enough to put you at risk, especially if a patient, if you're in that area for more than 15 minutes. But as long as you have your PPE on and the patient's wearing a mask, you're fairly safe. I think, you know, with the COVID-19 being out there and everybody's, um, a lot of people have the stigma attached now because people are teasing them for having COVID-19. And at the end of the day, we know that about 60 to 70 percent of the population is going to end up with COVID-19 uh, with either one symptom or all the symptoms or badly um, affected. You know, um, I would say if I had to go out uh, shopping or whatever the case, I'd be so scared to even cough because <laughs> people are going to look at me and think she's COVID positive. Yeah, I think it, it is. Yeah. That's the way we feel. It's very it. unnerving. I just want to find out, um, Nerusha, did you uh, experience any uh, death in your hands with COVID patients yet? It's a close okay. question, but uh, I, I think you know, I'm just here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, <laughs> And you say that I was actually speaking to the nurse in the ICU today and I said, you know, remember this time three weeks ago what happened and now it seems also peaceful. So, you know, um, three weeks ago when we, when we were in the midst of our storm, I was in the ICU and I think I had only about four patients there and it's a, it's a 12 bedded ICU. And all you see is one patient crashing, another patient, they're intubating, another patient, they're pulling out stuff. So we went, uh, I was helping them. So I wasn't really doing physio. I was trying to lend a hand. And, um, sorry, I'm thinking about this. Okay. And um, yeah, so I was helping them to set up a monitor and helping them to um, intubate a patient. And we were there for a few minutes and the patient didn't make it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And, and and on that day, we had about two, two deaths. Sure. That's the saddest thing ever. 
Um, how do you handle that? <laughs> Look, I think initially all these questions go through your mind. You question what your purpose is. Um, you question whether you're doing the right thing. But um, coming from a spiritual background, I think there is a higher force and there is a reason that this COVID is here and we are merely instruments. And if we do the best that we can, then we leave the rest to higher power. Absolutely. Sidasha, any experience on your side? Um, it's something I think every health professional can't shy away from. It's something that we were not ready for, the amount of death that we were gonna see. Um, and I think it was difficult because in my hospital, we are a team of 15 physios. And I started seeing how the emotions um, took over and it was very much a roller coaster. Um, so we kind of decided, I sat in with um, my second in charge physio and we, we thought, okay, there's some, we've got to intervene somehow. We need to come up with some method of how we deal with all of this because it, it happens on such a large scale that, like I say, we, we see death normally, but not at this scale. Um, so we kind of uh, put together a, a debriefing program. Uh, we debrief once a week. Uh, we do a team debriefing and we, we it's, it's not that we've had any training. It's us trying to uh, cope with the situation. Um, we, we try to talk about two positive things that has happened in the week or the last week and one possible negative um, that they want to speak about. And I think the nice thing about it was uh, everybody kind of understood that we were all going through the same feelings. Um, physios are very hard in general. Uh, if you chat to all physios, they're kind of tough. So they don't like to talk about emotions much. So that gave them the platform to share. Some shared more than others. Others were more silent about it, but it gave them the opportunity. And we in our sixth week now of doing debriefing, and I think everybody's kind of gotten used to it. And now they share a lot more openly without holding back. Um, the other thing we needed to uh, kick in was we found that the debriefing was uh, successful but we were shying away from being active. Uh, I think working in such a stressful environment, you kind of, when you go home, you enclose yourself in your shell, you want to catch up on Netflix, you binge eat a little bit, and then it's work the next day. So what we did was we also insisted that at least once a week to have some sort of an exercise class or um, a board game or something uh, other than just our normal debriefing. Uh, we, we've, found that the benefits are much better from the exercises. Obviously from a physio perspective, we know all the hormones that are released when you exercise, um, but some weeks are just tougher than others and we just don't make it on time to do it. So we just play a little game or yeah, something silly, but it helps. It helps in the coping with a team of 15, it's difficult. Um, but yeah, I think they're handling it much better now. So would you say that uh Physiotherapy is a female dominated profession and can you give me some stats? Uh, it's definitely a female dominated profession. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, you know, when in our class, how many males did we have? <laughs> I think there were three. Yeah, three out of 30 or something. Wow. Very much uh, female dominating. Uh, but yeah. remember, as much as we say it is a female dominating profession, we are still challenged yes. in a male dominated medical profession um, where, listen, this is quite a, a difficult thing because for me, we talk about gender, we talk about race, and we talk about socioeconomic challenges that many people have to face. And for me, if we all had to live in equality, forget about gender, forget about race, forget about social, social uh, inequalities, then I think it, your question of what is dominating wouldn't exist. Absolutely. And if we see Absolutely. that, that, that right. will make better option, you know. Um, so, yeah, um, from a point of even um, in private practice, we have that uh, challenges. Uh, which is something that hopefully we can change so that there is continuity. I mean, the cycle of life will continue. We can't just be biased towards one section or monopolizing towards one section or be racist towards one section or be feminist or, um, you know, gender-based on one section. 
in order for the cycle to continue, we all need to work in equality. Nirusha, I just want to find out from you, I think um, with people that are going to view this or the audience here now, can you take us through ventilation? You know, um, is it a doctor's responsibility? Because I'm trying to get my head around this. Is it a doctor's responsibility or is it a physiotherapist's responsibility? Or how is, how is it managed by both professions? Okay. okay, so ventilation means giving air. Okay, I think you may be saying intubation when a patient is on a ventilator. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, but I also want to know the ventilation process. You know, how it's put okay. in, who manages that? Um, do you have to go and check on it or does the doctor check on it or the nurses? Okay. What's that process? Okay. All right, so it is um, the, the, the ventilation settings and the, the whole process of intubating a patient comes from the specialists, okay? So the doctors, the intensivists, if your hospital has an intensivist, or a um, pulmonologist or um, an ethetist or whoever specializes in intubation. It is critical care at the end of the day. Uh, so they are responsible uh, in, for, in, for intubating the patient. And then obviously the nurse comes and makes sure that um, the, the, the doctor may ask, okay, we want a specific setting uh, to help this patient to breathe better, just monitor the progress of this patient, monitor the medication, monitor the uh, uh, hemodynamic status. So that's where the nurse is there. And then um, throughout that time, uh, physiotherapists are involved with helping to maintain this hemodynamic status, making sure that the airways are open. Am I correct, Sid? Um, um, Making, making sure that the airways are open, helping with respiratory uh, physiotherapy. Also, remember I said to you that post intubation and ventilation, patients come in with this thing called ICU acquired weakness. So passively moving their limbs. Make, but you remember, everything changes all the time. So it's all patient specific. It's not a one size fits all. Sometimes you may go into the ICU and the patient is unstable. And all you can do is say, okay, I'm not doing anything today. Or the, or the nurse may say, please help me change the blend in here, or please help me with this. And that's where you have to lend a hand. And it's not merely doing your job only. Okay. Um, Sidasha, okay, I'm tested positive for COVID-19. I'm at home. Um, how do I manage my symptoms? When do I know, um, when is the appropriate time to seek more medical care or attention? Um, can you maybe take me through that? I think a lot of the patients that are at home have mild symptoms and panic a little bit when they start hearing a lot of the things like, oh, should I actually be at a hospital? I'm not getting a bed. And the doctors make a decision based on, okay, this patient is actually stable enough, even though they have COVID. If you can self-isolate at home, home is where you need to be. Uh, I think things start getting a little bit more difficult once a patient starts experiencing symptoms of shortness of breath with minimal exertion. So like very simple activities, having a shower in the morning and you're extremely short of breath, uh, walking from your room to the bathroom, which is very close and you're very short of breath. Or the, the one thing I heard my own patients tell me were when I was lying in bed, if my chest was so sore, it felt like broken glass. Uh, and I, I heard it a few times. I heard a few other patients mention it. And I thought, you know what, this sounds very harsh. I've never heard another patient tell me that it sounded like, oh, it felt like broken glass in your chest. But that was the sound and the feeling of pain that they felt. And at that point, you realize that the amount of secretions that are in those lungs is so much more than they can cope with, together with if they have shortness of breath. That's when they need to actually seek assistance. Sometimes it might not necessarily be that they need to be in hospital, but they might need physio just to teach them simple breathing exercises on how to get rid of that phlegm. Uh, simple positioning on how to allow them to breathe better at night. Um, a lot of the time, the patients, they don't realize that, you know, sleeping on my tummy might be an option. I think when you have your lungs feeling so affected, that's the last thing you want to do. And I, I had awake patients telling me, how must I lie on my tummy? That's the worst thing. I'm not going to be able to breathe. And then when we position them with pillows and we tilt their bed, they, they're so comfortable. I'd say 10 minutes while I'm into talking to them, they're fast asleep because they hadn't got a wink of sleep for two nights before that. Um, so yeah, it depends. It's, it's patient to patient. 
um, if they have the option to uh, even uh, there's quite a few uh, websites and YouTube videos on simple breathing exercises for COVID patients. Um, Nero, I'm sure you also for your patients. Um, yeah, I, I think we touched most of it, but one thing that I want to touch on is patients that have uh, chronic respiratory problems, um, like your asthmatics, um, COPDs, and even sometimes non-chronic patients, we call this term happy hypoxia, where the patient may be looking absolutely well, but their oxygen levels are way below the norm. So if you've been tested with COVID-19, and you start, um, you'll have, you'll start breathing a little bit rapidly, but you'll still feel normal. Everybody looking at you will look at it, you normal. So one thing to measure it is to, firstly, I think be in, be in contact with your GP. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you had the symptoms, call them every two days and just tell them, you know, this is how you're feeling. And if you have a pulse oximeter, I'm sure everybody knows what, the thing, what that is, the small device that you put in your finger to measure your oxygenation. And that is a good indication to a good parameter to show um, when you should be worried, when you should seek uh, hospitalization, when you should seek supplemental oxygen. Uh, but at home treatment, yes, absolutely correct. Positioning, lying on the tummy, as we explained earlier, slow, shallow breathing, uh, rest if you have to, uh, drink lots of fluids, um, you know, eat a, eat a balanced diet, try and have some, something to eat. And uh, yeah, but I think the important thing is to be in contact with your GP and watch out for these signs. Great advice uh, from Sidasha and Nirusha. I think, um, you know, tonight with the president's address, uh, we're going to obviously have an ease on, on lockdown uh, again. So I think it's important for people to, t to take those extra precautions um, and look after themselves. Just on closing, um, very briefly, um, do you want to add something, Sirasha? I think uh, Nero's covered most of it with regards to the home care and things like that. I think none of us uh, were prepared for this, but uh, we're all taking it in our stride. Uh, I think it's highlighted the role that physiotherapy plays with patients and patient care, which is something that gets uh, swept under the carpet quite often. And uh, I think even the doctors uh, in our own hospitals sometimes don't realize what can be done for their patients. And they have a little more appreciation when you do work with them at this point, when they see you not shying away from the massive task at hand, donning with them, going in with them, spending a lot more time with the patients than a lot of the staff are. Um, and I think in government, I don't know if it's been the same with Nehru, but she can also add, uh, like Nehru said, there's a lot of visitors that are not allowed to come in or no visitors allowed to come in actually and visit them. And we've had some patients been in the unit for, for very long. And like she said, they do get depressed. Obviously you wanna to speak to your loved ones. You want, to, you want them to know how you're doing. So uh, there was um, an initiative uh, by, I think it was Docs with Flops, which is an Instagram page, where they encouraged health workers in the hospitals working in the COVID units to try and uh, link these patients up with their families. And just to, cover up your phone in the protective gear and make a phone call, let them speak to somebody. And our hospital, we tried to do it. We had a lot of phone calls made. We had a lot of physios that were very happy and lots of patients that were very happy. And we also found that, um, I think that was probably three weeks in when we found that the patients were being rushed in. Um, they were coming in unprepared. Uh, there was no time to pack a hospital bag. There was, you're just rushing with an ambulance in because it's a life or death situation. You need oxygen, you gotta go, you gotta go now. And at our hospital, we started a small initiative for our COVID patients with little care packs. So we've been uh, grateful to receive a lot of assistance from the community, from the Rotary Ants Club, um, and then just family and friends that have been so gracious. Um, so we put in a little toothbrush, a toothpaste, a face cloth, just the essentials and a little note for the patients to hang in there. So it's, that it's is tough so, times. That is so sweet. I think, um, Sidasha, I'm going to tag you on the post. So if anybody wants to contribute towards this initiative, then they can contact you directly. That's perfect. Thank you. Nerusha, just very really quickly, 30 seconds on closing your last words. Um, okay, so... 
it's it like with everything it will pass this COVID will pass um we need to um do our best to help um you know flatten the curve we cannot be complacent as you said the president's gonna you know um talk this evening and probably let us down on the levels we can't afford to be complacent this is a time where we need to show our best shine wear your mask social distance and wash your hands and I, and Sid is right you know when you sit in that hospital I mean when the patients sit in the hospital they sit alone and as um, medical professionals are watching this you know a small a small small just listening to them or even helping them with the video call we've done it a few times and it makes a huge difference patients feel stressed out they feel worried and if you can just give them a little bit of time and i think they're they, they're quite grateful the fact that you can sacrifice your time to be there for them um that's what i found patients are very grateful but we will persevere and we will get through this such an informative session, ladies. Um, Kami Gavinder says, thanks for representing us. Well done, take care. And I think you have given the world advice right now. And uh, we should actually take that extra precaution because we want to be safe. We don't want to be sitting alone or dying alone. I think it's important. Those are the important messages because throughout the world, people are dying alone as well. So take care, everybody. Thank you to everyone that watched this and be safe. Thank you, Shamila. Thanks, Thank you. Sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.